um, move on to um, Dr. Joe Minetsky. He um, currently serves as the um, foundation for the NIH as the Associate Vice President of Research Partnerships and the Director of Biomarker Consortium since 2016. Um, Although many of you may be familiar with the FNIH, I'll just share on a personal note that the FNIH actually sponsored uh, the med it sponsors a uh, NIH program called the Medical Research Scholars Program that I participated in 24 years ago, and um, it without a doubt shaped my career in academic medicine and clinical research. So it is a pleasure to have Dr. Manetsky here on behalf of FNIH uh, to talk about their um, biomarker program as well. Dr. Manetsky. Thank you. Um, I was going to say that uh, you know I've been been at the FNIH for six years, and and probably none of you have heard of the FNIH because it's one of these things that uh, doesn't get uh, out very often. But but I I was proven wrong, which I was I'm very happy to be in this case. So yeah, FNIH has been around for quite some time, um, and uh, but I have I've only been here for six years, and uh, prior to that I I've spent two decades in big pharma. And based on what we do, and I hope to explain today, um, you'll, you'll understand why I, I moved to the foundation. I also feel like I, I should be saying something like, uh, you know, this is, this is a different discussion than what you've heard from the last uh, several uh, presentations in the sense that we don't have any, we don't, it's not a specific network particularly for pediatric or, or maternal health, it's, it's a uh, platform uh, to build those. And, uh, and so with the next slide, I'm gonna go through a little bit of a brief description about what the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health is. And uh, you can see from here that we were actually created by Congress. We have some very specific uh, characteristics that allow us to work with NIH and other um, um, uh, agencies, but particularly NIH, to facilitate groundbreaking research. And we do this um, in a number of ways, but uh, most of them, a lot of them are built on collaborative research projects and partnerships. And these are in building large public-private partnerships um, where we, we include uh, multiple academic institutions, multiple institutes, and, and multiple industry or private members, also foundations and others. And the, the reason we can do this is because we have the ability um, to talk to NIH and find out what they're interested in, go talk to industry, find out what they're interested in, and then get us all sitting at a table to, uh, to discuss what we might be able to do better together that we, or what we can't do uh, alone. And if, and, and if a individual from NIH went to talk to an individual from Pfizer directly and the, the person from Pfizer or some other, not picking on Pfizer, but uh, that company said, well, if you did this research, I'll give you a million dollars, um, that would be a problem. Um, and both of those uh, people would be um, in, in some serious trouble. We can do that though. We can sit and say, you know, NIH, if we had a million dollars, would you be interested in doing this? And, and, and start to guide some of that. But we just don't do it with just one, in, uh, one uh, industry member. We'll, we will do that with multiple industry members. Um, there's some additional. And so the next slide tells you a little bit about what FNIH does over the past 25 years, we've raised over a billion dollars. That's gone, most of it's gone to NIH or directly to research projects, 90, 90 cents of every dollar. We've had a lot of programs. We have a lot of active programs and we are, and we are recognized as being, um, uh, using our, our funding appropriately. And so that's what the charity now Navigator ratings is we are a not-for-profit, a separate 501c3. We are not part of NIH. Um, and, uh, and so that's why the Charity Navigator ratings are so important to us. Uh, the next slide describes how we build public-private partnerships and the kinds of things we do before we even start doing research or doing any kind of work. 
we, we establish the governance so that everybody understands where they stand. We, we really drive policy management. One of the things that we, we do is provide a safe harbor. Some might say uh, Switzerland, where people can come talk and um, in, interact with one another in an in a area where, in, a, in a, uh, a situation where uh, there are not going to be that many uh, negative ramifications of, of uh, those interactions. We are a very strong program management and project management shop. All of our people are really good at getting people together and trying to herd cats, um, as we say frequently. Um, and, and then we'll do the fundraising and the, all of the relationship management. And then it, finally, we will do what we can to manage the intellectual property. But what I will tell you is sometimes the easiest way to manage intellectual property is promise you get, you're not gonna get any. And so quite frequently, we work in a pre-competitive space where part of the project, part of the, what everyone right from the beginning uh, of a project agrees to is that there will be no intellectual property generated from that, that project and everything will go directly into the public uh, sphere as quickly as possible. And that's, that's pretty much how we react and our, that's pretty much how we work through most of our, of our programs. Um, the next slide shows you the kinds of criteria that we look at for our partnerships. And that is uh, that there needs to be, you know, they're relatively, um, th a few of them are relatively uh, obvious. They, there needs to be a significant unmet need with high potential impact. That's generally not a problem uh, because we work with NIH and we support NIH's mission and pretty much a lot of that is an un what we're doing is is trying to to address a uh, unmet need and uh, with high potential impact. Um, not all projects are useful or can, are suited to a public private partnership. Um, if we have a single entity, a single industry, or a single foundation who wants to do something, and they could do it directly with NIH or directly with a uh, academic investigator, they're better off doing it that way. Um, we will let them. We will point them to the investigator. We will point the investigator to the, the foundation or the direct, the direct industry member, but we'll step back because that's just not what we do. We look for projects that have multiple uh, industry members and, and multiple uh, acad uh, multiple uh, government and academic members. Currently, our, our max is, I think we have 16 uh, uh, industry members on one project, and then on that same project, there are 13 ICs. So the institute, 13 separate institutes. So when I say there, and, and multiple academic institutions. So when I say big projects, I mean complicated big projects. Um, they have to be something that the private sector will, will pay for. So that's, um, but that sometimes is part of our job is to convincing them that they should pay for it um, because it's the right thing to do or it's going to actually benefit them in the future. Um, we prefer to have executive level sponsorship from our organizations, uh, both our, our industry members, when we talk to R&D heads Every, every day, um, but we also talk to the directors of the institutes as well, because if we don't have the directors of the institutes in, involved, then frequently the support doesn't sustain. And that's an important part of having projects that, that are more than a, a few months long. Um, we frequently like to uh, leverage NI, NIH's um, contribution and our, our, like I said earlier, our strong program and project management is a clear added value. So we don't actually have pro, a, a, a specific program um, in, in, uh, in as, as we were talking about, but we do have multiple models. And so the next sl slide shows you that we have lots of flexibility as to how we, uh, this did not, just make believe those ovals include 
the uh, all of the partners and uh, all of the vendors and scientists on one side and NIH and intramural scientists on the other side. Those ovals are supposed to be a little bigger. Uh, but at any rate, normally when we take uh, money from private partners, um, we can we can distribute it to research in two different ways, big ways. One of them is we can take that money and provide it to NIH and NIH can supplement the grants as just, here's something that um, we're doing, at, you know, NIH is doing. If we had another $10 million, we would be able to do a bunch more things. And, and the industry or our private partners are interested in giving us $10 million or giving NIH $10 million. And so we, we collect that and give it to NIH for those projects. If, if the partners wanted to do that on their own, it's not certain it would go to the project. The other thing that we can do, and we do frequently, is take those, those funds and give them, or you know, provide them, actually provide them directly to our scientists, coordinating centers, and vendors, et cetera, um, and, and have all of them be part of the project along with the private partners and the NIH. And so that's it, also a very um, open discussion. And again, all of those data um, become public as quickly as possible and the science is shared um, with everyone. So um, that is a model that works. These are models that have worked for us for quite some time. We have, you know, and you can imagine everything in between where 70% goes to NIH and 30% we um, deal with, vice versa. All right, so that's, that's the kind of, of way that we look at funding. And the next slide, which I think is my last slide or next to last slide, is some select partnerships that we've worked on. And so these are very large public-private partnerships. Um, and the, the top one, actually, the Accelerating Medicines Partnership has been going on since 2013. It, it is now the one with 15 institution, institutes, 28 companies, not 14, and, uh, and 27 not-for-profit organizations that have been, that are included in that um, partnership. These are generally uh, directed towards identifying new targets for therapeutic intervention in, in uh, diseases. We've uh, just recently included a, uh, a, an AMP, we call them AMPs because Accelerating Medicine Partnership is long. Um, that's in, the, in gene therapy, it's called the Bespoke Gene Therapy uh, Consortium. That clearly has got some interest in pediatric indications as you might expect. There's a lot of information on that. Actually, in the data that, um, that we uploaded, I think, for pre-read or after-read. So you're, you're welcome to do that. Um, we also have partnerships in cancer. Uh, the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, or ADNI, was something that we helped start, NIA start, uh, 18 years ago. Um, multiple companies. Um, and this is one of the situations where the companies knew that this was gonna be important for their livelihood in the future um, because they knew they were gonna need additional imaging um, than, than what NIH was planning and could do. And so they, they included more money to, um, to NIH in order to do that. Uh, FNIH really, was, the research projects really started out of the grand challenges and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So that's something that has been going on for many years many years, and we definitely have a very strong interest in global health, and in fact, continue to have an interest in global health and with respect to, to maternal health, right, where, where we are helping administer the A-plus trial, which is the azithromycin um, in uh, perinatal uh, uh, populations. We also have a, um, a, an add-on to that that's being uh, administered by FNIH that's, that's uh, um, IV iron uh, in, in, in those situations, in, in um, delivery, I believe. Um, at any rate, so there's, there's a lot of things going on there. We have a, I, I saw some discussion around master protocols. 
FNIH has been very involved uh, since actually OMOP and, uh, and um, um, I spy and um, lung map is a is a most recent adding to that where we've put together master protocols for uh, lung cancer where the protocols all set up the patients are are across the country and uh, companies bring compounds to the to the um, the trial and uh, are placed in a, a particular arm based on biomarker um, studies. The Biomarker Consortium is the next one down, is, has been going on for now uh, 16, 17 years. Uh, we have a really strong uh, background in biomarker uh, validation and qualification through the FDA. Uh, this is actually, as, as uh, was stated, I, I ran this consortium for many years and um, very proud to say that uh, it's been directly linked to at least 13 or 14 drugs that have been approved. And so um, it's, a, it's a, a very strong uh, program for uh, identifying tools that are uh, available for making clinical decisions, particularly in registration, uh, in this area of registration. And then finally, over the past two years, my life has been completely subsumed with accelerating COVID-19 therapeutic interventions and vaccines. This has been a, 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 a giant um, program that was driven by NIH, but FNIH administered the, the program. And, um, and it included everything from identifying preclinical requirements and preclinical resources for uh, COVID, for, for developing COVID uh, interventions through um, multiple, I think we were up to, we're up to like eight or nine master protocols for therapeutics in various populations within um, uh, COVID-19. And so, and then guidance for uh, uh, vaccines. One of the, actually, it's interesting, we're talking about network of networks, because one of the original working groups that, that uh, active um, worked through was identifying all the networks within NIH in particular that would be available for running trials for therapeutics. And, uh, and it's not an e that's not an easy thing because they're not connected necessarily. There is no big list at NIH of all the, the networks of trials. So um, it's, it's important to be doing what we're doing today, which is this is what's available. Um, and, and this is the kinds of things that we can do. The Biomarkers Consortium is working on preeclampsia. They're, they're working on a number of, of areas. We've done um, aut autism biomarkers as well, which is not exactly the same thing as what we're talking about here, but um, as, and then we've been very involved in uh, pediatric oncology target um, uh, discussions and, and guidance. And so, while we're not necessarily a um, focused exclusively on maternal health, uh, we are we do have pro projects in this area. We do have close connections with NICHD and and folks like Aaron, um, so which is probably why I'm here. And um, and uh, we're interested, always interested in doing projects and working on on programs that will have an impact in areas that will you know, eventually uh, help patients. So that's all I have. Thank you, Dr. Manetsky, for that uh, summary of what's going on at FNIH. Really appreciate it.